Uh, my name is Roland Pentala. Welcome to a presentation by the Albuquerque Historical Society on Little Beaver Town. Um, Little Beaver Town uh, existed from 1961 to 1963 here in Albuquerque at the mouth of the Tijeras Canyon and um, is a part of a uh, history of Albuquerque that is uh, now gone. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, the topic of the conversation is Little Beaver Town 60 years later. And um, when we talk about Little Beaver Town, it's the Old West theme park that was here and not the TV show, a contemporaneous TV show that ran in the early 60s, in fact, from 57 to 63. And you might remember the little kid at the bottom of the picture here. Um, Beaver Cleaver. He was not the little beaver we're talking about today. Before I go on, uh, I should mention that Red Rider and Little Beaver are now registered trademarks of the Red Rider Enterprises Incorporated in Tampa, Florida. And this is owned by the heirs of Steve Schlesinger and we'll talk about him later. Roland, we're seeing your whole uh, desktop. How about um, that better? Yes, thank you. Um, so Little Beaver Town, this is a little map that kind of shows you where it is with respect to Albuquerque, um, east I-40, uh, east of Tramway on the south side of the freeway was the south side of uh, then um, the four lane divided Route 66. And it was intended to be a tourist attraction that would not only be uh, for the local residents of Albuquerque, but also it was hoping to gather up the folks who were traveling around uh, on Route 66. Here's a, another picture of it using a current uh, picture, a current uh, aerial photo. And the area in red there is where Little Beaver Town was. Um, I've talked to some people who were teenagers or a little bit older in um, Albuquerque, and they said they didn't know about the theme park, but they did know that it was a place to ride uh, motorcycles. And people used to call it, let's go to Beaver Town to ride motorcycles. One gentleman says, I never knew why it was called Beaver Town. Um, and we know now. Here is an older um, aerial photo from the 1960s taken by Dick Kent. And you can see uh, Little Beaver Town's actually in this photo. And Western Skies Hotel is just to the west of it over on the left. And there's Route 66 before there was a freeway. The east. I don't know if you notice it, but the eastbound lanes of 66 were the, or were the old two lane version, which is turned into a single or double lane eastbound. And then they built a <clears throat> northerly one that went west. And that's what made the four lane Route 66, even back in the 60s. Oh, I wanted to show you something else. You notice where Western Skies uh, Hotel is, there's a road that crosses underneath the Route 66 at the time, and it kind of goes up to the north and disappears. Well, that's tramway, because nothing east of Juan Tabo Boulevard existed at that time. So Red Rider, uh, and who was Little Beaver? Um, Fred Harmon was an artist, um, a, a, a very serious oil, Western oil artist, um, but he had to make a living and selling paintings wasn't uh, good enough. So he came up with a, a couple of Western characters and one of them was Red Rider. He was the more um, successful one. And um, in this early series or this early comic, from something called the Crackajack Funny. 
Red Rider is introduced and how he met Little Beaver is also introduced. Little Beaver's father, the chief of the tribe, not specific what tribe that was, was injured while uh, breaking a horse and dies. And so Red Rider decides to take on um, Little Beaver. You'll notice in this com comic that Red Rider is a redhead and probably how he got his name. Although he always is pictured wearing a red shirt with a yellow bandana. So um, Fred Harmon was drawing certain characters and he just wasn't making uh, any headway until he met with a gentleman named Steve Schlesinger. Steve Schlesinger lived in, or this was in New York City. He was a lawyer, he was a publisher and a comics syndicator. And Red, uh, Fred Harmon went to him and uh, told him, showed him some of his drawings and his ideas and Schlesinger and he both came up with um, the idea for Red Rider and Little Beaver. And because of Schlesinger's marketing uh, knowledge, it turned into comic scripts, comic books, rodeos, coloring books, all sorts of licensed products, including the one at the bottom here, the Red Rider Daisy Rifle, the BB gun. And the Red Rider BB gun was featured uh, prominently in the movie A Christmas Story in 1983, which told about nine-year-old Ralphie, and all he wanted was an official Red Rider carbine action, 200 shot range model, air rifle with a compass in the stock and a sundial. And every time he referred to it, he sped it that way. And it was watching this movie for the first time during one of the annual marathons that I really became interested in Red Rider. And then later found out that Fred Harmon lived in Albuquerque, in fact, only just a few blocks from my house. And uh, I went down the rabbit hole that brought me to Little Beaver Town. Fred Harmon actually styled Red Rider after his own personal experiences. Uh, as a young man, Fred Harmon uh, moved with his parents to Southern Colorado and homesteaded a land in the or, uh, land in the mountains. And um, he grew up there as a real life cowboy with red hair. Um, this is a picture of him at their homestead in Colorado. Uh, Red Rider's horse name was Black Horse named Thunder. And uh, coincidentally, maybe not, um, Fred Harmon's Black Horse was named Thunder. So this is a picture of Fred Harmon. And um, at that time, he was drawing a strip, uh, comic strip was called The Bronc Peeler. Bronc Peeler was the character. Well, Bronc Peeler was kind of a rough guy. He, he, he wasn't very educated. He spoke um, kind of bad, uh, often was uh, not the nicest person. And, um, and it was Schlesinger's idea to turn Bronc Peeler into a nicer, kind of a hero figure of Red Rider. I found out that Fred Harmon actually had worked in St. Joseph, Missouri and also in Kansas City and worked hand in hand or shoulder to shoulder with Walt Disney. In fact, those two became friends and Harmon and Disney went into business uh, doing cartoons or something. And um, unfortunately that business failed Walt Disney decided to go to California and Harmon didn't go with him. Um, and that's a story that, you know, a what if story of the ages. Um, Fred Harmon finally moved to the 33 where he was uh, editing and publishing an illustrated Western theme magazine called Ride. And it didn't work out either. It failed after three uh, issues. Um, he moved to New York in 38, uh, where he met Steve Schlesinger and turned the Bronx Peeler into Red Rider. And, you know, I mentioned that Fred Harmon lived in Albuquerque and, um, and the, 
after he was doing his Red Rider uh, comic strip, at in those days, you drew up your comic strip much larger than the size it was in the in the comics, and um, then those pages had to be sent to New York um, pretty much every day for them to be published and syndicated into the newspapers. That was the only way they could be transmitted. And he could not do that from Bogosa Springs, which he considered to be his home because the small airport there was not an all weather airport and closed for many months during the winter. So he had a home here in Albuquerque and during the winter he lived here so he could get his dailies back to New York every day without fail. Harmon was quite a character. He was one of the original five members of the Cowboy Artists of America, which still exists, along with Joe Beeler, Charlie Dye, John Hampton, and George Pippin. Um, some of Fred Harmon's oil paintings are on permanent display at the National Cowboy Hall of Fame in Oklahoma City. He is one of only 75 white men to be adopted into the Navajo Nation. He received the Sertoma Award as Colorado's Outstanding Citizen in 58. Um, Pagosa Springs had had a regular annual July 4th weekend called the Red Rider Roundup. During the pan uh, pandemic, it's been closed, but it's probably going to start up maybe this year, may, uh, certainly next. And Dulce um, in northern New Mexico has had an annual Little Beaver celebration on July 15th um, for 59 years. It also had to shut down during the pandemic. Fred Harmon unfortunately died in Phoenix, Arizona in 1982 at the age of 80. Fred Harmon would regularly appear in, in um, parades in Southern Colorado riding his horse Thunder. And he appeared as Red Rider. Again, this is the connection between himself and the comic strip. But he needed a young boy to um, appear with him as Red Rider. And in this case, uh, in this picture, uh, in the Monta Vista, Colorado parade, uh, the Little Beaver was played by Sammy Trujillo. Uh, he was friends with a lot of um, Native Americans in Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado. So here's the front page of that Crackerjack Funny in which Red Rider was uh, introduced. This is the first time the character was in any comic strip. Um, and that was uh, 1939 in March. Uh, but it was a while. Next year, it took until the first complete Red Rider comic in which the entire comic was all Red Rider was September of 1940. And Dell Comics had launched its line of Red Rider in August of 41. And uh, the Dell Comics version ran for 151 issues ending in 1957 and remains one of the longest continuous newsstand runs of any Western comic. So here's a typical uh, Red Rider comic strip that appeared in many newspapers. It started at a daily in 1939, uh, sometimes used ghost writers or other people than Fred uh, Harmon. It ran in 750 newspapers in 1950s, and the readership was estimated to be 40 million. So it was quite popular uh, as a daily newspaper comic. Here's some examples of Red Rider comics. The one on the left is no, the number one issue, uh, August of 41. And if you were wanting to buy that today, um, get your checkbook ready. It's going to cost you $750 to $1,000, depending on the quality of it. There was also a Red Rider painting book or coloring book uh, that was uh, sketched by uh, Fred Harmon. And you can get that today for a bargain, $120 to $185 on eBay. Collier's Magazine, which was popular in the uh, mid to late 40s, did a story about Red Rider. And, and I think Steve Schlesinger um, had that article or portions of it reprinted and used to hand it out to everybody. On the left, there is um, a list 
of places where Red Rider material uh, would exist. It, it had a live radio show. Um, it, uh, there were motion pictures. We'll talk about that a little bit later. J.C. Penney's had a whole section uh, for Red Rider. Um, there were phonograph records. Um, it just went on and on. It was quite an industry. Uh, Steven Schlesinger uh, made a lot of money off of Red Rider, not so much Fred Harmon. Here's the front cover of the Collier's magazine in which Red Rider appeared. And Donna Reed was on the cover. Remember Donna Reed? So this is um, uh, a DVD that I actually purchased. I own this one, The Adventures of Red Rider. Um, this one was starred, uh, starred by um, an actor named Don Barry, and he felt that he really um, loved the character so much, he took on the nickname Red and used it for the rest of his life in whatever um, acting jobs he got. Here are some of the actors who played Red Rider in movies and the lists of movies that were made. Uh, Alan Lane was in some, Wild Bill Elliott and Jim Bannon appeared in a number of them. Um, aside, Robert Blake uh, even played young uh, Little Beaver 23 times in movies. And there's this cute little face in a promotional picture on the left. Uh, many of you will know him as Beretta, the detective or the cop um, from the TV show from 75 to 78. So how did Little Beaver or how did Little Beaver, Beaver Town get started? Howard Hall, he was a training officer and executive for Standard Oil. And he was retiring in Albuquerque and kind of interested in the Old West and Native Americans. And he got the idea of creating a theme park, which was going to be called the First American Indian Land. And he got the idea in the late 50s, but it took him a, quite a bit of time to gather up um, the idea and uh, talk with a, a number of people uh, to really get the thing started. And he arranged for the sale of stock and a partner named C. Morgan Carter uh, started it up and started to sell shares and he was going to make a salary and he and um, Morgan Carter were gonna make a salary from this venture. And um, I th think he may have had the idea that uh, his park here in Albuquerque might become as popular as the ghost town at Knott's Berry Farm. And this is a, a picture of Knott's Berry Farm in about the 1940s. And it was very similar, uh, an old Western themed town, almost a movie set that you could um, walk through. So here the newspapers start taking notice. Uh, this one was from February 28th, 1960 announcing that a multi-million dollar Indian land was going to be underway. They said it was going to be built on the site of Albuquerque's first Pony Express station. In all my research, I cannot verify that. It, I don't, nobody ever knows where the Pony Express station was in Albuquerque. If you do, let me know. Uh, here are some list of some of the attractions that they had proposed, uh, including a 500 person restaurant in which an authentic Indian chief would chat with the youngsters. Um, that's kind of a, a sentence you wouldn't see today. So the president is determined to be uh, Ernie Sudran, who was a service station operator. That's how he probably knew Howard Hall. And Howard was noted as the developer of the idea and he would be the manager. And then you can see that a gentleman named E.G. Hendricks was vice president, John Cameron secretary, Eugene Malcho uh, treasurer, and the directors were going to be Mears, Klein, Odell, Ackerman, Green, 
and Morgan Carter. And this is the jobs that they had at the time they took on first American Indian land. And by the way, um, this venture was gonna be called first American Indian land. And today, not many corporations are known as much by their long name as they are by their uh, nicknames or initials. So what are the initials of first American Indian land? F-A-I-L. Hmm, prophetic? So they brought on this gentleman named Bill Errett, who was a well-known collector of Western mementos. He was gonna be the operations manager. He had quite a reputation in Albuquerque at that time. And he was the owner of the Longhorn Ranch and the Museum of the Old West in Moriarty. And so, uh, he agreed to be the operations manager and supervise the historical accuracy of the buildings and the decorations. This was um, a prospectus that was used to help sell stock. And you'll notice the sign there that says First American Indian Land. Um, and the prospectus, which is on the, there's an original copy of it, at the Center for Southwest Research at UNM. And these are some images from that prospectus. Uh, it is uh, quite flowery in its language. Down the dusty miles of the Santa Fe Trail come the colorful inhabitants of this, America's first Indian land. At the edge of Albuquerque in the heart of the great Southwestern desert, first American Indian land calls forth the spirit of the Navajo, Apache, and Pueblo Indians, of Coronado and his brave conquistadores, of the tough stagecoach drivers who rode dauntless through the wilds, of the Western miner who plied for gold in the face of insurmountable toil. So work is started, the paper says in May of 1960, um, and the governor of New Mexico came down to help turn the first shovel and stated, if we can get every and each tourist to stay over just one additional day, we can double the state's income from tourism. Well, that told you why he was interested in it. 75 people showed up for the groundbreaking. And here's a newspaper photo of the governor with um, Ernest Sudrin turning the shovel. Here's a, a legal prospectus of, of Indian land. And you'll notice that this is 1960, only three months after the newspaper article that they were starting. And there's already major changes to the officers and directors. And this doesn't seem to bode well now, I can't find out why they left, but you can see these first three with the yellow gone are all gone. They, they quit. They're no longer directors or associated with it. Something turned their stomach or made them at least worried. And then at the bottom with the green new are all the people who jumped in to um, kind of be the new directors. And you can see that this is trouble on the horizon because it's only, it's 13 months from opening, only two months from the groundbreaking, and already there's a major shakeup in the board of directors. And here's the legal prospectus talking about how many uh, shares that they were able to sell. And because it was a, a corporation in New Mexico, you could only sell um, stock to New Mexicans, or as it was said in the, the uh, prospectus, bona fide residents of New Mexico. And here's the, the shares that were outstanding and who owned them. Um, you can see that Fred Harmon at that time owned 10,000. So somehow he had been, um, invited to join the enterprise and um, to bring in the name of Red Rider and Little Beaver. This is the first time 
that first American Indian land and Red Rider Little Beaver were now joined. That was in May 15th of 1961. Here's uh, a image of one of the actual first American Indian land stock certificates. And this one is owned by Alan Carlson, uh, who I appreciate loaned me this so I could take this image so we could all see it. Looks very, very official here. These are 15 shares. Um, his parents bought these shares for Alan, uh, thinking that it might be an investment in his son's uh, college. Um, as it turned out, um, no. So this is the paper in April of 61 uh, that officializes the fact that Fred Harmon is now uh, a part of First American Indian Land and that the attraction is going to actually be named Little Beaver Town, not First American Indian Land as the sign in the prospectus indicated. It also announced that they had hired somebody, a gentleman named Dave Saunders, who will play uh, Red Rider, and that a 12-year-old Hickory Apache boy from Dulce, Troy Vicente, is going to pose as Little Beaver at the park. Fred Harmon knew Troy and had appeared with him in parades in Colorado. And when Troy started working at Little Beaver Town, because he, his parents lived in Dulce, which is quite a drive, he would actually stay with the Harmons here in Southeast Heights. So here's some advertisements in the paper for stock sales. You could get them for $3 a share. I, I find it interesting also, if you look down three quarters of the way down this uh, image, that their business offices are at 309 Washington Southeast, which is uh, maybe two blocks south of Central. And I live uh, very close to that in South e Southeast Heights and drive by 309 Washington pretty much on a daily basis. So Little Beaver Town's starting to take shape. The wood frames are up. Now these buildings were built permanently. They were not some kind of movie set that had no backside. They had 16, uh, studs 16 inch on center, fire breaks, plumbing, everything uh, that you'd expect in a permanent building in these. So um, this, this was supposed to last for a, a long time. The land itself was not purchased by the park, but leased from a corporation that at that time was called Research Park. Um, my wife Peggy worked for Sandia and her offices were in something called Research Park down at the end of Wyoming. And I don't think that those two names are the same, but um, different corporations, same name. These photos were taken by Bill Lasker. Bill Lasker was a photographer for Sandia and left his job in order to become a part of Little Beaver Town and own a private photo studio, which is actually the first building that you can see on the right side of these images with the tall top on it. That was gonna be the photo studio. They built some teepees out of uh, two by sixes. They were, they were covered by plaster. Um, and I don't know what was in them. There are no photos and no descriptions of what was inside, um, but this is what they look like. And then it had, you can see, leading from one of those, um, you can see an adobe wall that was on the north side of the property and kind of kept people from wandering in. You had to go through the gates. And uh, Troy Vicente here is photographed by um, Dick Kent. I believe, I'm not sure, but uh, it seems like his work. Here's an aerial view, um, and I don't know the photographer's name. I don't believe this is Dick Kent because he was a professional photographer and his, the quality of his photographs were amazing. So uh, this is kind of fuzzy and it might've been somebody else. But you can see the large graded area to the left that was gonna be the parking lot. And then um, the buildings are starting to take shape. 
in uh, 1961, the paper announced that Little Beaver Town has purchased a, a quotes vintage. Now, it's a vintage 1865 train. However, it's a it's a model train basically. It's um, it's a reproduction, a tiny reproduction, um, sold by the Allen Herschel Company. Now, Allen Herschel Company built all sorts of rides for theme parks and um, included trains, um, every, everything that would be an amusement park, Allen Herschel Company built it. So it was a gasoline powered engine. It would have three uh, coaches or, or um, little trailers, I guess. Um, and they were gonna build a track around the outside of it and Marco Construction was going to build the track and a trestle, and it was going to cost $20,000. Um, if you look at the cost of the train itself and the track, that translates to a, a price of around $206,000 in today's dollars. Here's a picture from the Allen Herschel catalog of the quotes 1865 train. Um, it doesn't show the scale, but the driver of the train would sit on the tender behind it, and um, it's a miniature train. Had an appealing bit of Americana, as the catalog says. So opening day occurred on July 15th, 1961. So that'll in July of this year, that'll be 60 years ago. They had a lot of advertising in the paper. Um, and this, the sensitivity about Native Americans, in fact, everybody at that time was much less than it is today. Uh, listen to this pigeon English that was supposed to be Little Beaver speaking English um, as not a native uh, language. You betcha, Indian dances for Albuquerque pale faces. Come get them free little beaver headdress. Me and Red Rider have have them fun at grand opening Saturday and Sunday, nine to ten. So that kind of um, language would never be used today, but it was a different era sixty years ago. That was considered okay. It's not okay today. Here's another pro promotional photo, and this was taken by Bill Lasker um, because Monty Montana and his wife were going to be here. Now, Monty Montana was a quite a rodeo personality. He was a trick rider, uh, so was his wife. They would do roping trips and riding trips, and um, they were going to be part of the attraction at the opening day in July of 1961. And standing there next to the horses is Fred Harmon in front of the sheriff's office, in fact. And here are some um, memorabilia. I have to thank Vicki uh, Langwell Lasker for, or Lasker Langwell for um, sharing these with me. Um, matchbooks. Um, I actually have uh, one of the tickets, Little Beaver Town ticket. Um, here was a flyer that they made up. Uh, and I got this from John Saunders, who is the son of Dave Saunders. He has collected and has uh, saved a number of Red Rider, I wouldn't say a number, He's got quite a collection of Red Rider memorabilia, including stuff from uh, Little Beaver Town here in Albuquerque. And here again is some more of that bad English. Me and Red Rider plan them big fun this week, um, weekend. You betcha. Em. And this also advertised Monty Montana, Monty Montana, um, who, who is referred to as the Dean of Western Trick Ropers. Here's the parking lot on open, opening day, and this is a Lasker photo also. Um, and you can see 
there were a lot of cars in that parking lot. So when they graded that flat spot, they did some research. The ticket booth is there on the right of this picture where you would buy your ticket to walk in under the frame there that has the American flag. And then this fence uh, you can see in front of the cars was to keep you from getting in and also from stepping in front of the miniature train. You can see the track there um, going through this photo. If you're interested in uh, 60s cars, it's a great photo. So here's a picture of Troy Vicente and Dave Saunders who would be there at the park to greet visitors. And, um, you know, it was open 12 hours or 16 hours till 10 p.m. And here's this 12, 13 year old boy, Troy, who was expected to be there and perform. And I don't know that he got paid that much from Fred Harmon or anybody who was running the park. And so um, it, he did it pretty much for no pay at all. Here are some photos from opening day. And you'll recall that they were handing out these headdresses. So there's some pictures of them in the upper right. If you got there that day, you got um, your free feathered headrest. There's Troy standing on a Hogan. They had an actual uh, Hogan there along with those uh, teepees that existed. Um, and then there's Monty Montana doing a roping trick there uh, on Main Street. Here's another photograph uh, taken on opening day and you can see there's quite a number of people there. Uh, the largest store was the General Mercantile Store. Uh, it was called the Rattlesnake. Uh, to the left of that building, you can see that they've got on display uh, an, a horse-drawn hearse. I don't know where they found these and I don't know where they've gotten to. In this view, looking west, uh, I've tried to find uh, Western skies and I, I don't know if that's it in the background, I, I can't tell. So Fred Harmon actually had an art gallery. I don't think that he worked there very often, but certainly uh, he sold uh, the what they call uh, dailies, though that large thing that Dave Saunders is holding there. Um, another little beaver was Arnold Vigil, who was uh, Troy's cousin. To kind of split up the time that they would be there, Troy asked that somebody else be Little Beaver, and so. They, he asked her, his cousin, Arnold Vigil, and, and Arnold uh, stood in as Little Beaver every once in a while. So there's, in the lower right, you can see Monte Montana, um, who is um, roping Dave Saunders and his wife. Here are some black and white photos of the site. And you'll notice in the lower left, the Little Beaver Town sign is there. You can see that the parking lot was so full that they had cars parked out on uh, Route 66 on the shoulder. I don't think that made the state police happy that day, but. So the day after the, the grand opening, the paper prints that um, 5,000 had attended Little Beaver Town. So it looked like it was gonna be a success, right? Here's a picture taken in the Lasker studio, um, in the interior of the Lasker studio. You could actually, um, they had some costumes you could dress up in. It was really a, a, a Civil War costume and you could get your photo taken there. And I'm gonna move my cursor. I hope you can see this. This is. Mrs. Lasker, Vicky's mother. And I think this might be Troy down here. And there were other Indian performers uh, there during that day. Um, I don't, unfortunately, I don't know the names of all the others who were in this picture. This gentleman up here was one of the gunfighters.
these are the concessionaires of Little Beaver Town, and I'm not sure how much money they had to invest, uh, but you can see there's an artist, a woodcarver, uh, Bill Lasker, of course, as the photographer. Sudren ran the general store, the rattlesnake. Um, a guy named Bob Johnson, who had riding or Four Hills riding stables, ran the stagecoach. Um, Benny Atencio was the curios shop, and he also organized the Indian dances. Here's a photo that was taken uh, from the rising terrain to the north of Little Beaver Town, looking to the south. And you can see all the sprawling complex. The largest building was the Red Bull Saloon. Of course, it was called a saloon mostly because uh, of the Old West theme, but no alcohol was ever served there. I think uh, Pepsi was the strongest drink you could get but they did have uh, dances in there. You could sit around and drink a soda, probably get a hot dog and watch dances. Uh, the building just to the right of the Red Bull Saloon was called the Western Skies Motel. Um, and there was a tie-in. No one actually stayed in that building, but you could go in that building and they had a telephone line where you could call and make a reservation at the actual Western Skies. So um, it, uh, it was uh, kind of the 1960s version of the internet. Then the gun shop was off to the right side there. Um, let's see what else I wanna point out. Oh, when you look over to the left, you can see where the old Western store, uh, Main Street was. Um, there was kind of a food court in the middle where it, you, the arrow says food court. Uh, the sheriff's office was at the bank or at the back with the bank. And then on the left, on the far left side, that was the Indian Pueblo building. So those buildings were stucco, not wood, like on the Old West store. And then there was a large concrete slab where they would do Indian dances. And this is a view that I took today from that very few point looking over there and, and you can see um, Little Beaver Town is just a pile of dirt. So this is the interior of uh, Bill Lasker's studio and um, that's Bill Lasker's wife uh, standing there behind the counter and that's Vicki standing in front. Um, that cigar store Indian figure, which was in that store for the whole time, the three years, actually is now in Vicky's uh, living room. And that's a picture of Vicky standing next to the Indian in her living room in Albuquerque here. Here's the Red Bull Saloon. That's the bar that was down on the first floor. They had a second story that kind of ringed the uh, northern side of it, where you could look up there. They had Western bands that played on the stage, as well as the dancers. And they would have uh, gunfighters come in, and the, uh, the dancing ladies would talk to the gunfighters. That was part of your entertainment. Here's the Gay Paris Review, along with musicians. The dancers were organized and trained by a lady named Kay Windsor, uh, who had a number of dance studios here in town. Maybe some of you may remember that. I believe that the lady in the upper right is Kay Windsor. No one has confirmed that for me, and I can't find any other images of her to make sure, but I believe that is Kay Windsor. They even had magicians. So there's William Phillips, who was performing as Phillips the Great on stage at the Red Bull Saloon. Here's a little bit better picture of how the tables were set up at the Red Bull. Uh, 
And here's that train. You can see, you get a better uh, concept of the size of the train when you compare it to the humans that are standing by it or sitting in it. That wooden trestle there, uh, all that's left is a couple of concrete foundations. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. And here's the stagecoach. The stagecoach would uh, take you on a, a dirt road around the outside. Alan Carlson shared these with me. Um, they were taken by him and or his parents when he was there. There was an even there was even a wedding that was um, at Little Beaver Town. Talk about that a little bit later. So here's some of the buildings. You can see that there's a spitting image gun maker there where you could buy a daisy rifle. Then they had a, a newspaper shop where you could go in and you could have your name put in the headlines like, you know, Roland Pentola captured by the sheriff or whatever. Uh, then there you could buy some old Western art. Then there was the Lasker Studio Gallery. Uh, and then the Red Bull Saloon is in the background. And you can see that they would um, take little kids around the park on burrow rides. Now, I don't see any safety straps or helmets on any of these kids. They're just sitting there ready to fall. You know, nobody would do that today. Over in the far right, you can see another ride. That's the only picture or mention I have of it is they had like Shetland ponies pulling a miniature uh, wagon and then it would take you around the, the site also. So here's a picture of Ben Atencio who is running the curio shop. Uh, in the upper right, you can see that there are some cloth teepees as well as those uh, ones covered by plaster at the far ends. And you can see the uh, concrete slab in which the Indian dances were performed. Hoop dances and eagle dances. Now, Troy Vincenti was actually a uh, award-winning dancer, and he tells me he was he performed at Little Beaver Town too. So he did double duty. He was Little Beaver and he was a dancer. And recently, I came into contact with somebody who had a professional. 16 millimeter film that had been taken about Little Beaver Town. And it turns out this gentleman who owned it and let me use it had purchased it from the Fred Harmon Museum um, when uh, the museum um, failed. It, uh, the land for the museum in Pagosa Springs was sold to the county who's going to make it into a regional jail. Um, and you can't go to the Pagosa Springs um, Museum anymore. But this is that great film. Now, because it's the 1960s and this is 16 millimeter, no sound was ever done for this. And maybe they planned on using it for promotional purposes and then um, narrating over the top of it. Off to the right now, you can see Western Skies. This is driving now east beyond. There's Western Skies, they just passed it. And they're driving along the frontage road that beautiful Chrysler. Big sign, Little Beaver Town, quarter mile ahead. Here you are rolling up on it. Here's a shot from that same high point that I, uh, I showed you earlier. There's the Little Beaver Town sign. There's the train. By the way, the smoke from that train, it's a little gasoline engine, um, like a lawnmower engine, but they had a device that squirted uh, some chemical on a hot part of the, the device that made smoke. There's uh, Dave Saunders on the right. Troy Vicente and uh, the gentleman in black was the bad guy. 
and we'll talk about him a little bit later. So you can see the job of Dave Saunders was just to go around and kind of um, talk to people, shake their hands, say hi. This I'm told that this was shot on July 15th of 1961, opening day. So this is the opening day crowd. You can see in the background there, they had an ice cream parlor. There's the gun maker shop. Uh oh, it's a gunfight. Little or Red Rider is being tackled. There's a state police officer. No, he's just a security guy. They dressed funny in those days. There's the opening day crowd, shielding their eyes from the afternoon sun. Here are some uh, Native American dancers getting ready to perform. I'm going to hesitate and not say that these guys are trying to do a hatchet job on each other. I'm not going to say that. But you can see that quite a number of people were there um, watching. And I think this uh, highlights the goal of Howard Hall when he created this was that it was going to honor uh, the Old West, including uh, Native Americans who were the first American Indians or first Americans. So while the language of Little Beaver was not very um, PC, certainly they were highlighting uh, American Indians and not Puebloan Indians of just New Mexico and Arizona, uh, the whole Indian culture of the United States, including the Plains Indians. And I'd like to thank uh, Daniel Gibson who purchased this film from the Fred Harmon estate and has allowed me to show this in my presentations. I believe that this gentleman is performing something they call the Eagle Dance, which once you hear that, you go, oh, sure. And this, I'm now sure that this is called the Hoop Dance. And I think that's obvious also. And if this looks easy, try it. Oh, they got Dave Saunders involved in it. And Little Beaver, there they are dancing. What footwork. So you can see from the age of these kids, uh, they look to be from five to 10. So that means they were born in the mid to late fifties. Uh, and um, and there's a couple of Kay Windsor's dancers in their uh, French outfits, risque for the time maybe. I'm not sure who this is. I do believe that um, uh, Mrs. Lasker would dress up. So that could be a picture of her. I'll have to ask Vicki if she knows that's her mom. And you can see uh, that Dave Saunders is fully decked out in his red shirt and yellow handkerchief. Now, every day the bank was robbed, I think twice, maybe three times a day. And um, the robbers would come roaring out of the bank with guns ablazing, and uh, Red Rider would shoot it out with them, only protected by a barrel. 
And there is Little Beaver who brought him his gun, I guess. One of the bad guys is already down. Oh, people are being shot. But Little Beaver comes to Red Rider, Rider's aid and helps them up. Don't forget your hat. Oh, he forgot it. And there's the train. It's just gone over the vessel. Here it is coming into the station by the parking lot. I'm not sure if rides were included in the price of admission or if that was a separate uh, cost. And now we're actually going to go on a ride. You can see the ENCO station off to the right. So Little Beaver and uh, Red Rider are actually on the train. There's the stagecoach pulled by four horses. There goes the borough rides. These were rides that were brought over from well, we'll talk about that later. There's that TP that was made out of plaster with painted symbols on top. <clears throat> now, Fred Armand may have actually had this shot for his own purposes, because it seems too shaky, it, it not really professionally done. Um, it, it is sharp because it's 16 millimeter, but um, it doesn't seem like it would even been the quality that was available at that time. There's the Mad Mouse roller coaster. and the helicopter ride, Beavertown Depot. There's the little cars you could drive in. This is the Indian section now, this is the Pueblo. And I think this was the Curios shop that was run by Ben Atencio. And then with a cigarette in his hand. And that's it. So the guy in black, he called himself Waco Williams, and he competed in many fastest gun tournaments around the West. His actual name was Ken Lemke, and um, he was shot four times a day by Red Rider uh, at Little Beaver Town. Um, he actually, his claim to fame also is if you watch the TV show Gunsmoke, uh, the opening shot of Gunsmoke, no pun intended, is where Marshal Matt Dillon is facing off with a bad guy down at the end of Main Street and they draw on each other and Matt Dillon shoots the bad guy dead. The guy they shot was Ken Lemke. Here's some more pictures from Alan Carlson's private selection. Alan, you know, he went there many times. So I, this wasn't just one visit. Here's Ken Lemke on the ground, 
being uh, guarded by Red Rider, AKA Dave Saunders. And the uh, young little beaver in the lower right hand corner, I'm told, is Arnold Vigil. Not Paul Vicente. These are shots from uh, Fred Harmon's son, Ricky. And Ricky lives here in Albuquerque. I'm not sure he was sick recently. I'm not sure how he's doing right now. He drove a cab in Albuquerque here for many years. And uh, Bill Lasker tried to make some money beyond just having his studio by taking pictures and making them into postcards. So these are four, call, I call them the Lasker postcards. There are four you can find on eBay every once in a while. I found one recently and the people that owned it wanted $50 for the one in the lower right with the train. So that nickel investment back in 1960 may have actually panned out. Here's a poster showing a uh, master magician, Phillips the Great. Uh, I note, look at this yellow box in the poster. Leave the children at Little Beaver Town while you visit the fair. So just drop off your kids and leave them there and go to the fair. How times have changed. So uh, remember I talked about those rides. Well, the Clifford, I call it the Clifford Hammond phase. Cliff, uh, you may know him as Uncle Cliff, uh, had an amusement park that was located on Lomas in the 700 or 7600 block. Right now there's a service station there across the street from a car dealership. But he, had, he was operating there, but the neighbors didn't like it. It was too noisy because he stayed open late in the summer night and they complained to the city and the city um, dropped his permit to operate that at the time. And so he needed a fast replacement location and talked with uh, the little Beavertown folks to see if he could put his uh, amusement park rides there temporarily. Although maybe he thought it was permanent um, apparently the arrangement was not satisfactory. There wasn't enough business or there was a disagreements. I'm not sure what the problem was, um, but Cliff proceeded with purchasing land along San Mateo near Asuna. And um, the rest of the story is that's where Uncle Cliff's is today. And there's a picture of Cliff Harmon who died in 2013 at the age of 97. Here are some more posters. Um, this is about the wedding. Wayne Seeger and Jenny Gallegos were married at Little Beaver Town. It's the only marriage that I know of that happened at Little Beaver Town. And if anybody knows either of them, please have them contact me. I'd like to show them these pictures and maybe find out about their experience. And here's a post wedding party with uh, some of the performers, uh, Waco Williams, uh, Ken Lemke is there. The gentleman on the far right is Fred Harmon, just to his right and the left of the picture is uh, Dave Saunders. So now we have more shakeup in the place. Uh, Ann Pickard, the president, resigns. Howard Hull now becomes the president. Uh, Ann Pickard only lasted for three months. Um, here's their stock, trying to sell some more stock. Um, uh, after the only first summer of operation, uh, they're losing money. They can't pay their rent. 
uh, they declare they only have $100 in assets and $235,000 in debt. So Fred and Lola Harmon agree to loan the corporation $47,000 just to keep going. And they take out a mortgage on their Southeast Heights home located at 700 Morningside. And there's a slight delay in the opening. They're gonna open on May 15th, um, but it arrives and they don't open. So more problems. Um, the landowner has now decided to go to court and told them to leave, uh, get off their property. Um, and um, things are heading south real fast. So in 62, they say they're going to reopen, but more financial troubles, more court cases. Um, here's a little thing. Marty Chavez is involved in this. When Marty was 16, um, he, he and his parents lived in the uh, Four Hills area, and he and his brother decided they would uh, hoof it over to the Little Beaver site and climb the very steep cliffs that are on the south side to climb up and get to Little Beaver Town. And he climbed halfway up, I guess, and, and got scared. He didn't want to go up anymore, and he didn't go down. So his older brother went to their home, and uh, they called the firemen, uh, and they came to rescue Marty Chavez. Here's uh, the these, uh, parade float in the State Fair Parade of the 1960s. Again, trying to uh, drum up business, I'm sure. There's Fred Harmon in his Western gear standing in front of the uh, stagecoach. And they had a little truck from Ed Black's uh, promoting Little Beaver Town. You can see there's uh, the magician there and the piano player and the uh, drummers and the can can girls. Here's a letter from the State Fair thanking him for his participation. Another ad from 62 free admission. So now they're not even charging admission, trying to get people in to spend money at the booths and other things. Um, now they announced that uh, a former Air Force major has joined as general manager and corporate public relations representative trying to pull out the spiral in 63. They're saying that it's going to open in 1963 on May 1st. Then if they didn't have enough bad news, one of the gunfighters, an 18-year-old Mike Hughes, um, gets injured because the gun that he was wearing uh, shot blanks, but it burned his leg. And um, so his parents sued and uh, they were awarded temporary disability of $20.40 a week plus about $500 in medical bills, and that's in 63. So here's a cartoon that Fred Harmon um, did in 1963. It says, why are we not in the papers anymore, Red Rider? And he says, he's too busy for us now, Little Beaver. He's painting purdy Western oils on canvas and we're on a permanent vacation. So Fred Harmon goes bankrupt. He loses his house in the Southeast Heights. He decides to quit drawing the car cartoons and comics, and he goes up to um, Pagosa to paint more oils and basically retires. So the building stayed. I can't find out whatever happened to them, but the saloon building uh, was used for a couple of years for charitable events uh, as the palace and later became the location of teen dances under the name of Sage City. And, and some I've heard from tell me that they attended dances at Sage City. And, and unfortunately, what, ha what happened is teen dances would happen there and people would go out to the cars in the parking lot and drink and act crazy. And so that became a problem for the local police. I don't know what happened to the building. Some people told me there were fires that burned them down 
Uh, as I told you earlier, they were permanent structures, so they couldn't be put on wheels and taken somewhere else. Um, something happened to them. They may have been torn down or they may have burned down. Unfortunately, the fire department does not keep fire records after five years. So if they had attended any fires and tried to put out those fires, there's no way to know because those records are gone. Here are some aerial photos taken by Dick Kent, which show the um, site um, in 63 after it was no longer in use. And these are great history pictures that show what it looked like and how it no longer exists. But at least we know exactly where the buildings were, what the layout looked like. There's the, the rail you can see surrounding the site along with that wood trestle up at the top of the picture. Uh, you can see Route 66 and the Western skies. So this is looking west. This picture is looking towards the parking lot, so it's looking north. Uh, that structure that's there in the parking lot used to be an old service station at this site. Um, it was never used as far as I know, um, but no one tore it down. It's not there anymore. Here's kind of looking north, uh, east, another view. Uh, call your attention to the red square. And you can see that there's a truck, flatbed truck there that I think used to pull a trailer. And here's a close up of that. On, on a trailer, they had a sign that said, turn here, uh, Fred Harmon's Little Beaver Town. And I think they would haul it out to the, the road. So it you know, would tell you where to turn. And it turns out that that sign, and here's a picture of it, it's in a antiques store on Manal called the Antiques on Manal. And Bob Harrington, who bought the sign years ago, um, has it on display behind his office or his cash register the, the, in, in the store. So if you want to visit a relic of Beavertown, um, it is there. And of course, there were court cases. The research park um, initially won a judgment saying that um, uh, some of the costs of research park or costs of Little Beavertown <clears throat> well, should be awarded uh, judgment, um, uh, mechanics liens, and Marco Construction, Yucca Plumbing, uh, B and D Electric Company. B and D still exists. I'm not sure about Marco. Um, they all sued because they never were paid for the construction work on the site. So the New Mexico Historic Review had an article, Volume 85, Number Three, Summer 2010, by uh, a professor of history talking about. Um, Little Beaver Town and what it was and, and what may have been its um, failure. According to him, it was that Interstate 40 had arrived. Uh, there were high parking and mission fees that didn't seem to be worth it. The quality of the acts didn't uh, stay up as they were on the opening day. And he states that New Mexico's tourist qualities lie in the authentic West and triculturalism and outdoor recreation, and that this kind of bit of Hollywood Old West really wasn't necessary. It wasn't as strong as New Mexico's real honest attractions. So there's this little thing. It turns out that it was a a New Mexico corporation and this company called Telecake that wanted to sell cakes that you could order through a telephone and send to anybody across the country. They needed permission to operate their business in New Mexico, and they found it easier to buy the license from Little Beaver than it was to get their own. And so they actually purchased uh, the rights or the, the, the corporation uh, in order to sell cakes by wire. 
here are some photos that I've taken in 2017 of the site. Uh, very little is left. On the upper left, there are some stairs up to what was the food court. In the upper right, that's the concrete slab where the Indian dances were held. Uh, and the lower left is the is the corner of one of the buildings, and on the right lower is a slab that had bathrooms. And I think it was um, over by the gun shop uh, west of the saloon. So Dave Saunders continued to uh, act as Red Rider in the uh, state fair. He would give performances. And um, so one, one time in 1999, he's walking into the state fairgrounds to give a performance and two, two state police officers stopped him and said, you can't bring guns onto this site. And he said, but I'm a performer and these are my, this is part of my uniform. And they said, well, what do you do? And he says, well, I, I perform as Red Rider. Well, these two 20 something state police officers in 1999 had no idea who Red Rider was. Finally, um, they let him through and let him keep his guns when they determined that they were unloaded. And here's a picture taken by uh, Todd Ashley and he loaned me this picture. It's hanging in my office right now, uh, taken in 2015 of Dave Saunders. Unfortunately, Dave died at the age of 84 in September of 2017. I got to meet him, but by the time that I met him, he was suffering from dementia and uh, really wasn't capable of um, a conversation. So there's been many articles about Little Beaver in the Route 66 magazines and New Mexico magazines. I'm sure if you search for them, they're easy to find. And I'd like to give thanks to the following people. It's a long list of those who helped me. Um, it was nice to meet Troy Vicente. Uh, when I gave this talk at the museum, uh, he actually came down from Dulce, where he is an officer of the tribe. And he brought his family and they enjoyed seeing Little Beaver Town that he had talked about very often, but they didn't have any concept of it. And it was nice for them to be able to see their dad and uh, what he did as a young person. So that is it, and I'm going to unshare right now. And uh, hopefully, if there's any questions in the chat, I can bring them up. And let's see. So Barbara Fuller says, I had never heard of Red Rider before. Well, good, now you know something. Janet Sayers uh, says a competitor to Beavertown was Kitty Land on Central near the State Fair. That ended up moving to North San Mateo and became Un Uncle Cliff's Investment Park. Um, I think Kitty Land was what I was talking about at 7600 block of um, Lomas. And, um, and it was run by Cliff Hammond. And Janet also says that some of that pigeon English came from contemporary shows called Long Ranger and, and Tonto spoke in that kind of broken English at the time. Um, and you're right, uh, one of my big favorite shows was the Long Ranger and I love Long Ranger and Tonto. I even had little uh, plastic Long Ranger on his horse silver, high O silver um, that I would play with as a kid. And uh, Janet also says that Little Beaver Town was a big spot for teenagers in the 60s. She went to Del Norte and the word would go out to meet up in the parking lot uh, and fun would ensue, I'm sure. Uh, Janet also says that the hoop dance is featured on a mural in the Hilton Hotel Andalus. Uh, yes, I've seen it, the mural in there. And, and if you want to see a mural of the hoop dance um, done by uh, WPA artist Lloyd Moreland, you certainly can find it there. 
Uh, are there any other questions? Are there any other people actually on the Zoom call anymore? I prefer to get these in person. I think people prefer to be there in person. Um, but until everybody is vaccinated and COVID is in the past, um, that's going to be it for us. So it is 3.30. It's a little bit later than I hoped it would be. And maybe some of you dropped off already. Um, that's the end of the presentation. Uh, thanks very much for joining on Facebook. I hope you enjoyed it. And Dan tells me that this will be a recording of this will be uh, up on the Facebook site uh, soon. Thank you and goodbye.